Okay, so this is clip two on my discussion between mercantilism versus comparative advantage. So what I want to do here is I want to present to you um, the comparative advantage critique that's sort of the Adam Smith sort of school of thought. And then I want to um, explain sort of why these two different philosophies exist. Okay. Um, and um, basically what it boils down to is what is the objective of a nation when it comes to international trade? Okay, so in other words, we're asking ourselves, if you're a government sitting there saying, should we engage in international trade or not? That could be one question, right? If, if a country said to itself, well, we're not going to be involved in international trade, that's called an autarky. Now, most nations in the world have opened up their borders to, to some extent, some more than others. Only a few um, areas sort of remain kind of uh, blocked off from trade. So now we say, okay, let's, let's assume the country, and most do say, okay, we're going to open trade. Let's, let's do trade. Then we have a question about what is sort of the objective, like why do we want to do this? And that's really where these two philosophies diverge. And that's why they exist. So depending upon your philosophy of what ought to be the purpose of having international trade would sort of influence whether you take more of a Smith view or the sort of mercantilist view. Okay. So basically, he, this, the comparative advantage argument is basically that it is not, that our, our goal should not be as a country to worry about so much about whether we have a positive current account. Okay, this, this idea that exports are um, higher than the imports. Okay, so we have a positive you know, trade surplus. Instead, what we should worry about is the volume of trade. Okay, that's what we should worry about. And here's why. The, um, the theory of comparative advantage, right, if, if we accept this, and so, okay, so this is our theory that explains why, you know, trade happens, why it's a good thing for on a, an overall grand scheme of things, is that it ultimately causes or encourages a nation to specialize in the production of certain products and to stop producing or reduce production of other products that they can't produce as, as effectively. Okay, so in other words we have each country will sort of specialize in its little niche area. Okay, so the idea would be, let's say, maybe Canada would specialize in production of, let's say, wood, because we have lots of forests and so on. And maybe, you know, Japan would specialize in production of, let's say, um, computer chips. And then, because they don't have, you know, he, he, all these huge forests and so on, they, 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 they you know, because they're a smaller country. And we're just this big, open country. Lots of space. Okay, so then Canada would specialize in that production of, of, of the wood, and then we would then export it to Japan. So Japan would import the, the wood to build houses or whatever. And then similarly, the Japanese would export their uh, computer chips to Canada, and we it would import it then. So you see, that's basically... Now, why this is important, why specialization is important, is because it can be shown through, you know, if you look into this in more depth, that if you want to raise the living standards of a country, then th this is the, the route to go, this specialization because of comparative advantage. So, in other words, to maximize your living standards of your citizens, then you want to go the route of comparative advantage. Okay? And because, of course, comparative advantage means that a country will only specialize in a few things, then there has to be lots of trade between nations. Right? So you could see that, you could have a situation could emerge where you have, say, Canada and Japan 
could both be engaged in tons of trade. Right? We're shipping tons of wood over there, and they're shipping tons of computer chips over to us. But let's say it works out that it balances out, so we have no surplus and no deficit. According to your trade, your textbook sort of world, this would be a bad thing, right? Oh my God, we we don't have a surplus. This is this is evil. But exactly, it's actually a good thing. There's lots of trade going on. That means there's lots of specialization going on, okay? And that, of course, is taking advantage of this comparative advantage concept, right? So that's why, for instance, in my book. It said that you know a large volume of trade, even though each country has a zero balance of trade, could be a good outcome, and that's and that's basically why, is because the more volume of stuff moving across borders means that there's more specialization going on, which means we're, we're exploiting this comparative advantage concept fully. Okay, so now you may wonder. I think that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I'll save I'll save that fun stuff for for, for later. Um, why, why, why? Why do these two philosophies exist? Well, again, it has to do with why, what is the objective of trade? The comparative advantage specializations, or Adam Smith version of this, the, vol the pro-volume version, is basically, it is operating on the assumption that the reason a country wants to engage in free trade, okay, trade, international trade, is because it wants to increase the standard of living of the population. Okay? The mercantilist view, this sort of, you know, uh, surplus is good, trade surplus is good, trade deficit is bad, it's kind of zero sum sort of philosophy that, you know, one country gains while the other one loses is actually based on a different philosophy of government, actually. And it is really based upon centralization of power, effectively. I mean, politics ultimately, you think of politics, you think power. Who has it, who can use it? And in particular, the, uh, the main primary objective of a mercantilist philosophy is to use international trade as a tool for building state power and in particular, military power. Okay, this is the, let's go conquer the world kind of view, the sort of imperialist. And in fact, my, when I look this up, right, the primary, yes, the primary objective of a surplus is so that a government can basically, uh, where is it? Yes, military power, state power and yeah basically they do it the, the reason if you're a mercantilist you want to have all these trade surpluses like your textbook says is a good thing is because what it is is it allows the central bank or the government whatever to accumulate reserves whether it be gold or in the modern sense it'd be like currencies of other countries foreign exchange reserves and then you use that money to pay for your armies or to buy weapons from other countries or to finance your colonial expansions. So a mercantilist philosophy is really good if, if your government has a philosophy, I want to take over parts of the world. I want to start wars and, and take you over and turn you into my colony. This is wh how, why you would want to take a mercantilist view. Have huge trade surpluses because then you accumulate all this, this, these reserves, which then you can use to buy and build armies. Okay, so basically here's the trade-off. If you want to have a government that's all about power and control and, and centralized power that sort of dominates the world, be an imperialist, then take a mercantilist point of view, like your textbook wants you to do. It says it's a favorable, it's good, it's wonderful. If on the other hand you want to increase the, the standard of living of your average citizens by taking advantage of comparative advantage and specialization of of, uh, of labor, right, or of the country, right, specialization in what it produces, then you take the other one, the um, volume of trade argument.